I'm Dave Kemp, and I'm president of Cure PSP. And we're thrilled to have our new associates in Canada. And this is the first and critically important step to having a global presence for Cure, Cure PSP. The diseases are not respected by national boundaries, and our plan is to have a worldwide network of patients, families, caregivers, researchers, and healthcare professionals to help end the global scourge of neurodegeneration. <clears throat> so this is, um, I want to acknowledge Trish Caruana, who's somewhere running around. Uh, Trish. Trish does a fantastic job. If you've, you may not have been to these before, but um, she does an incredible job at organizing these, these conferences and other events. And these are very, very important part of Cure PSP's mission. And we're dedicated to increasing these, to building them, to making them bigger and better and more useful. <clears throat> We're on the threshold of tremendous adva advances in finding treatment and cure for neurodegeneration. And Cure PSP is firmly at the center of this. PSP, CBD, and other prime of life diseases are increasingly the focus of research into neurodegeneration and are seen by, by many as the keys to unlocking the secrets of the entire spectrum of neurodegenerative diseases, including things like Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's disease. So uh, very excited to have everybody here, very excited to have our first international affiliate here across the border. And I'm gonna make a couple of announcements that Trish has asked me to before we, uh, before we get into the uh, program. <clears throat> and the first one is that we're going to have a raffle for a brand new iPad that will be now before lunch. So just be, be aware of that. Before lunch, we'll have a raffle. Uh, we do have a photographer who will be taking pictures, as you might expect. And he will ask for your names. And the purpose of the photography will be to help us going forward to promote our future conferences. Uh, you will be asked before we use any photography, you will be given a printed, send a printed release and you'll, you'll need to give your permission to use that photography before we use it. But the purpose is to try to promote these conferences to get a, to a broader, to a broader audience. And uh, thirdly, there is a a uh, quiet room available for everyone that's down the hall. It's called here the Monarch Room and down the hall on your left. So I'm sure it'll be easy to find. Welcome to, uh, to go there anytime uh, anyone, anyone needs a break. So <clears throat> without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Mary Ellen Duncan, who is the Vice President of the Board of Directors of Cure PSP Canada. And we're thrilled to have her. Mary Ellen. Good morning, everybody. Um, I met some of you last night. It was fun to get to know you. First, I would like to introduce our new directors of PSP Canada. As I said last night, five wonderful ladies that have given their time, lots of effort, and lots of work. And Hopefully, we will get many volunteers that can help us because this is a hard job. We want to get out to as many people as we can because it's so important that we learn and help other people with PSP, MSA, and CBD. So first, I would like to introduce MJ. You want to stand up, MJ, please? Come on. MJ is our president. She's 
She is also the support leader of our Kingston branch of our caregivers and families. Uh, there's Karen. She's also from Kingston. There's Debbie from Ottawa. And Kimberly from past Toronto. I don't remember what city. From. And of course, there's our ever-loving Trish. She's our adopted Canadian now. <laughs> she works with us and she's been on our backs for months trying to help us learn about PSP, try to get the, na the name of PSP and try to get as many people to this conference as we could. And it's so wonderful, there's such a wonderful turnout today. Sure gives us hope that we can succeed in passing this message on in Canada and in the world because it's so important. We do need volunteers. Anybody who would like to volunteer to help us in any city, possibly start a support group. MJ and all of us on the board of directors would only be too happy to help you. We now have business cards. We can all give you business cards with our email addresses and everything on it so you can get in touch with us. We now have a uh, direct toll-free 800 number or 888 number, and we can, you can get in touch with us that way. Uh, that phone, num phone goes into MJ's house, not my house, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is going to be merchandise is still out in the hallway if anybody's interested in purchasing some of it. And it's really beautiful. It's all been customized for Canada. It has a little maple leaf down on the bottom and most of the things. And that's absolutely wonderful. They've done a wonderful job in the States doing all of this merchandise, all this new printed material for us in Canada. It's, it's, it, I can't thank Dave and his crew there for having this all done. Thanks. Now, last night I was at your meeting, and for those who are here, saw the hope there. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of hope. If you're on the face on Facebook and you see the uh, PSPA uh, logo, hope belongs to the PSPA group. This belongs to a gentleman in Scotland. His daughter bought it for comfort for him. And he decided that he would like to send the bear around the world. And it has been from Scotland to uh, Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania to uh, Mount Vernon, New York. And when I saw it in uh, Mount Vernon, New York, I emailed and asked if I could have it in Canada. Because I thought it would be fun to bring it to the meeting. And so you people could see it. Possibly we could do this in Canada some different way and have you write in the journal. There's a journal here that everybody that's seen the bear sort of put passed on their responses and their stories of their loved ones. I have written about my husband Bob, a lot of you met, and also in mine I have put a, a thing about our conference so they know that we've had a conference in Canada, the first ever, and I would like to pass it on to someone today. I would love for some people to sign the book and possibly take, let me take a picture of them so I can send it to the gentleman in Scotland because he is going to the Parliament in Scotland on the 17th to try to get more help in Scotland for people with PSP. So this is hope. We do have hope that somehow we'll find a cure and I hope that you all will enjoy the conference and you will get some information that you possibly didn't know and they'll help us in the future. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. I forgot one thing. There's a little table over in the corner here. This is Monique's table. She's here to help you in face. If you have any uh, health issues and, or anything like that, she does uh, work for that and will help you um, if you have, need financial support. Just talk to her. Get some forms from her. She's done wonders. It's for a tax credit for people with disabilities. 
And if you're interested, just give her a talk. Go talk to her. She'll give you a business card if you don't have time today, and you can give her a call at another time. She goes right across Canada, and she'll be glad to help you. Monique and her girls. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I have some degree of aversion to being tied around a, lec a lectern. But it is wonderful to see this turnout this morning. Uh, and uh, thank you all for being here. You know, that we, we, we'll have some interplay in terms of how we say things, in terms of your teaching me how to say O-U-T again. Uh, and, uh, but uh, so a little bit of my background, I am, a, uh, I am a neurologist. I do predominantly movement disorders and uh, multiple sclerosis. Basically, I am a neurologist who deals with chronic diseases of the, of the uh, nervous system. And uh, I started, um, uh, was born in England in uh, Oxford, uh, spent my four formative years in Canada uh, and have been um, uh, in the U.S. since 1972. Uh, and uh, the other half, Kathy, uh, who I met in uh, Wisconsin, has been with me on that journey um, in every step uh, and continues to work with me uh, in our center. So. Um, that's who I basically am. Uh, and, but now, this is not the first time that I had, that members of my family have been here testifying uh, or talking about. Uh, and so, the Senate of Canada uh, Special Committee on Science Policy isn't that special, but a special committee on science policy. Not a special committee, committee on which politician committed which sin or whatever. <laughs> they actually the special committee on science, and the witness was Arthur Porter, head Industri Department of Industrial Engineering, Acting Director, Center of Culture and Technology at U of T. Uh, that was before the Senate. And Dad was testifying in 1968. That was the Um, yeah, we've been here before, and uh, that is Rio Hall in 1968, 1986, when he talked to you. Let's see. So, in, in, uh, uh, for a Canadian audience, uh, those were great, great times. So, when you look back at Canadian science, and this is, a, remember, this is a Canadian disease. This is a disease that was described in Canada. So what was going on, sorry about that, uh, in Canadian science back in the 50s and 60s? So there was the Avro Arrow, and people remember the Avro Arrow, the uh, interceptor that uh, project that got uh, canceled. And then there's a couple of things that you may not know, is there was a computer company in Toronto called Ferrantes, and the first mouse that was hooked up to a digital computer actually happened in Toronto. And it was a Canadian five-pin bowling ball. And that was what they used They used for on that digital computer. Ba over in um, uh, Montreal, Dr. Penfield was doing uh, incredible work with epilepsy. Uh, there was the early nuclear power development station in, uh, at Chalk River. And at the same time, rather quietly, uh, a neurologist in Toronto, Dr. Richardson, started uh, seeing people with this unusual neurological disorder. So the people who discovered the disease, as I said, we're going to do, we have to do some uh, orientation in terms of pronunciation. Because of my spending 23 years in Wisconsin with its big Polish population, I know how to pronounce this, the neuropathologist's name. It's not Olszewski. It is Olszewski. And that is the way the Poles pronounce it. In fact, if most people had 
learned how to pronounce it, Steel Richardson Olszewski. So it, it might have not ended up being ESP. It might, like Parkinson's, have continued with the names of the people who described it. But Olszewski became a neuro neuropathologist in Poland around 1937, and he uh, had to work in um, uh, Polish hospitals during uh, World War II. How he escaped the um, uh, wipeout of intelligentsia by Hitler uh, is uh, a great miracle. And in terms of movement disorders, one can think of two people who escaped from that, and one was obvious, the other one was obviously Pope John Paul. Um, so in 1944, he flees Poland and becomes a medic with the Canadian Army. He happened to walk into a Canadian regiment and said, uh, here I am, I'm a Polish doctor, I can help you. Um, and uh, so 1946, Richardson restarts uh, practice in uh, Toronto, 19, having served in the military. 47, Olszewski arrived in Canada uh, with 25 cents in his pocket. He was repatriated here with the regiment because they loved him so much. Uh, and uh, he happened to meet Dr. Penfield on the train. Penfield says there's something better we can do than, than being a night porter. Uh, here's my business card, so he got rid of all of the, of the administrative stuff and got, got uh, Olszewski retrained as a, as a physician. Uh, 55, Richardson is consulted by his neighbor in Toronto, who was the out of the uh, original series of six cases. There were um, a couple of uh, Canadian Army veterans who were in chronic care at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. Um, and uh, 61, Olszewski arrived at uh, University of Toronto as chief of neuropathology, he having been in Montreal before then. Uh, John Steele began his residency in uh, neurology. John Steele for, um, is our uh, honorary chairperson. John, um, from doing this seminal work as a resident, has gone on and spent his career in the island of Guam where there is a unique neurological disorder characterized, which is rather like PSP, but it is um, uh, uh, unique to those specific islanders. And John has had a, a tremendous career doing that. Um, and in 64, Richardson presented his cases to the American Neurological Association. So um, the, that, at that presentation, he was presenting and there were two chairs of the session sitting behind him. One was Dr. Derek Brown, who was chair at Harvard, who uh, was a, a New Zealander who had uh, arrived at Harvard by way of, of uh, London and Montreal. And the other was Dr. Houston Merritt. And Dr. Houston Merritt had written uh, a textbook in neurology that went into 17 editions. Dr. Merritt looked at uh, Dr. Denny Brown and said, uh, I've never seen anything like this before. And Der Denny Brown fired back at him, uh, it must be something called drinking water. <laughs> so, uh, but when we think about this in terms of we have all of the technology that we have, and these were Dr. Richardson's tools. Now, that's, this is quite accurate, because that's the modern Littmann stethoscope. He had an old Rappaport Sprague, but at any rate. Uh, and, and you say, well, what's the coinage doing there? That's the way, that's the way Neurologists check for fine motor discrimination is can you tell a dime from a quarter, from a penny, et cetera. And those are uh, old techniques. And then, and then you can technique to see what your two-point discrimination was and a, a, a tuning fork to tell how one's vibration sense is and the ophthalmoscope to look at, look at the uh, uh, optic nerve and the retina. So, uh, and that was basically the diagnostic tool that Dr. Olszewski and Dr. Steele had, specifically an old microscope, exactly the same as we used back in medical school, uh, to look and the appropriate stains. So this, everybody tells us about this, this condition, we haven't, uh, it's not known. It's, it's, uh, it's so difficult to recognize, it's so difficult to see, and I think what I said about Dr. Derrick, uh, Dr. Denny Brown and Dr. Um, 
uh, merit, you can say the delay in, in recognition is, is epitomized by this expression that Sir Charles Simons retorted when a resident asked him a question when he was a visiting professor that have, had he ever seen anything, something before, a neurologic phenomenon, and he said, seen it, seen it a hundred times, but observed it, never. And when you think about, that, think about that, it's a very profound statement in terms of we do depend on physicians' powers of observation. But the challenges for early diagnosis in this disorder, disorder are huge. Yes, we know. It's a four-repeat tau-mediated disorder, but it doesn't present in one specific way. So the classic disorder, uh, Richardson syndrome, is probably about 20 or 25 percent of them. Uh, PSP, P, which is, stands for Parkinson's, just looks like Parkinson's disease. And, uh, and in fact, in a large uh, series of pathology that I will show you, um, uh, there are about 12.5% of people whose brains, uh, after they died, looked at them as they had PSP. They were never diagnosed during life. And these were Um, and then there is a form with lucidity and myoclonus, this type of jerking, and um, PSP, uh, PA, PAGF means episodic gait freezing where people will be walking and suddenly cannot proceed. Uh, and there is an additional variant where you have a progressive non-fluent loss of speech. You take uh, most uh, uh, neurologists confronted with a patient who has a loss of speech. The first thing they're going to say. Um, so uh, the other thing that's interesting in, in terms of this, and, and that this is what makes this so difficult, is that in a rec this recent case series in terms of 64 cases of PSP, is that they had other brain findings as well. So 20 of the 64 had features of concomitant Alzheimer's disease. 33 had white matter rarefaction. Uh, and um, uh, this, is, well, this, was, this is a phenomenon that was originally described uh, at Western. Um, it is the significance of it we don't really fully, well, we thought we understood it in terms of white matter um, problems in multiple sclerosis. However, a uh, recent article in, in Movement Disorders um, uh, sort of casts some doubt on this, but at any rate. But where you see the white matter, it sort of takes you out of thinking uh, in the PSP line, because white matter disease and gray matter disease are different things. So all of this makes it difficult. And then, uh, and these are pathological things uh, that I won't cover. So, PSP symptoms early, loss of balance, development of visual symptoms, usually described as blurring, and I'm going to get to that later in terms of because this is the phenomenon where your eyes don't work and you go to the eye doctor and the eye doctor puts your eye in his machine and he looks and he says, your eyes are 20-20. I can't figure out why you can't see. Your eyes are 20-20. We will get to that. Development of personality change, um, uh, irritability, um, being uh, argumentative, sort of, and sort of difficult things to tell, you know, in terms of, of uh, the age group that we occupy and that these are prime of life diseases. Um, development of light intolerance, persistent squinting, and neck rigidity. So, um, CBGD, on the, other hand, on the other hand, is a phenomenon. It begins on one side, typically in the upper extremity. I have a delightful gentleman I have followed now for a couple of years who had it. It began in his foot, and it has now progressed to involve the entire left side. But it actually began in his foot, and he was, after seeing four neurologists in uh, North Carolina, he was eventually uh, including Duke. 
Uh, he was eventually seen at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville where the diagnosis was made, and I have followed him subsequent to that time. So um, development of balance walking difficulty, progressive dis uh, development of a speech disturbance. So that's where people will get the idea, do these people have multiple mini strokes and cognitive and speech disorder. So, uh, and so then if you then look, then you make things even more complicated. So you look at progressive supranuclear palsy and you look at multi-system atrophy and how do they differ and I've got a list here, falls, loss of balance, rigidity. We've talked about that before. Um, uh, difficulties with personality change, difficulties with cognitive impairment, sleep disorder we see in multisystem atrophy, and we have this loss of autonomic regulation, which is not really a part of PSP. And the loss of autonomic regulation, we have always, doctors like things where we can measure. We love things that you can measure. You, you measure a cholesterol, you can measure a blood pressure. But the, actually, the loss of autonomic regulation um, is something that is more difficult to measure. And, it's, and it is uh, interesting that we find it now that more reliably it is people have intermittent feelings that their legs are going to sink and that's part of the issue that they have with falls and balance. So, uh, this, I apologize for this slide uh, because I couldn't blow it up, but basically what we are saying, this is a, this is a, uh, the lengthy, an a lengthy analysis from autopsy data that was published relatively recently. This included data from the brain bank at Mayo down in Jacksonville. It also included data from um, uh, the brain bank at University of Saskatchewan. Ali Raj put the long-term uh, long neurologist at Saskatchewan, and I have a great fondness for, for Saskatchewan. I spent my middle school years in Saskatchewan when my dad was dean of engineering there. Uh, so ra um, when, when I see Royal Hospital at Saskatoon, it pay, I, I pay attention. But if you look at this latencies here in terms of diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, 4.9 years, 2.7 years, 5 years, 3.2 years, 4 years, depending upon the type. This is, this is a huge in terms of delay. And again, this slide does not show particularly well, but this is a time, um, this is a um, time chart here where the disease duration is on the bottom line here, and the number of patients is on the, um, on the vertical axis. And so as you can see, the, uh, as time passes, one out to 10 years, progressively increases the number of people with the gaze problem. Progressive increases the number with the movement problem. Progressively increases the number with frontal dis dysfunction. That implies uh, difficulties with thinking and behavioral change. Difficulties with swallowing difficulties with falls and see the falls rapidly going up, difficulties with tremor going up, uh, uh, not going up a bit, but then staying very stable, not what you would see with Parkinson's disease. Cognitive impairment, uh, again, progressively increasing, and then death, uh, a phenomenon that then, as you go through the course of the disease, um, it does, uh, the mortality rate progressively increases. So what do we have currently in terms of symptomatic treatment? So levodopa um, uh, is, uh, this is the 50th year that we have had levodopa for Parkinson's disease. And levodopa is to Parkinson's disease what um, insulin is to diabetes. And that's another, probably the greatest piece of Canadian science ever is uh, banting uh, and discovery of insulin in uh, 1921. Banting and, and best. Um, 
so levodopa for the Parkinson's variant, and, and it's useful, you can think about levodopa in exactly the same way for Parkinson's as we think about insulin for diabetes. Does it cure the disease? No. But it does replace a chemical, a neurotransmitter that is absent. And so when we start talking about neurological treatments, it's modifying effect rather than going to the beginning. And I'm, I'm going to get to that. But so uh, other things that we can do is, is, I think you remember, is the vision thing and squinting and light intolerance. So we can use botulinum toxin for the eyes. And that is an injection of, of Botox uh, or one of the other um, licensed products now, there are three of them, uh, around the eyelids, and you do get a improvement in, in at least the lid squinting for a period of about three months. And when it's done by somebody who's experienced and who's skilled, it's very worthwhile. Uh, but it's something you may have to ask for because it is not something that every neurologist who uh, is a movement disorder specialist is necessarily comfortable in doing. Um, as I had said, uh, myoclonal, uh, some of the, the drugs we use for spasticity in MS may help the muscle rigidity. It's highly variable. Myoclonus, uh, we use one of the seizure drugs uh, called uh, Keppra or Levetiracetam. Coenzyme Q, a uh, big study on coenzyme Q, and everybody asks about it, but the standard dosage that you get at the health food store is not particularly potent. We're talking about big doses to have any effect, and so you're talking of the order of $400 a month to get into a therapeutic dosage range. Northera is a drug that came out last August and uh, was introduced by Lundbeck. This is not a drug for PSP. This is a drug for the autonomic, the, the symptoms of blood pressure regulation in MSA. This uh, multi-system atrophy, this is, a, uh, this is a drug that we are just getting our feet wet with. Uh, and it's cert but it is certainly true that there are some people where it's, it's given remarkable change in life quality. I'm not sure what its status is in Canada in terms of uh, whether it's gone through approval yet. I suspect it probably has. So now, now that I've got you this sort of, this is the clinical basis. So what do these diseases look like? And why are these diseases different than say multiple sclerosis. So here is an MRI of an 18-year-old uh, neurologically normal college freshman. So you'd say, oh, you, you know, what, why do you Americans get uh, an MRI on an 18-year-old neurologically normal college freshman? Well, because, because her um, uh, uh, dad had a um, meningioma, and uh, that is a type of brain tumor, and she had new onset of headaches, and there is some in, uh, uh, inherited tendency towards that, which is why this was done. This is an interesting MRI from the standpoint it shows the beautiful, differ a beautiful differentiation between the gray matter on the outside and then the white matter tracks. And the white matter tracks in the human brain are hugely important. This is what differentiates us from um, uh, other, other mammals is that the white matter it has heavy protein coat, and that heavy protein coat translates into speed. So the white matter translates into, in computer speak, it, it translates into speed and bandwidth. And as any computer guru will tell you, we need speed and we need bandwidth in order for the thing to work properly. Uh, so here you see that actually in this young lady, the, the um, um, the frontal white matter doesn't show, it's not completely proteinized yet. In other words, the brain is still developing at the age of, of 18. And it's those frontal lobes that give you the check reflex, which is the, accounts for the fact that teenagers will uh, not infrequently engage mouth before brain is firmly in gear. <laughs> okay, so now this is the traditional picture now, I want you to just bear that picture of that normal brain 
in mind, okay? Look at, look at these central structures. Look at the cerebellum. Look at the brain stem here and look at this upper portion of the brain stem. And if you, if you spend, some, spend a couple of minutes looking at this, can you all see sort of the bird here? Can you see the bird in the middle? Okay, the beak, the breast, you know, you can see it. And you can see my essential tremor. And you can see the cerebellum, normal volume. All right. Then uh, this, is the this is a traditional picture of what PSP looks at. So looks like. So what do you see? Well, you see this is all. This is now different. This is now shrunken. And these midline structures here of the corpus callosum, you can see this is all. This is all thinned out. And you can see generally that the brain volume has gone down. Um, when you now, uh, however, in clinical practice, bearing that one, which is a typical one that I just showed you, that's the one in the books. Now you look at one. This is, this is one of my patients. And so... Do you see, actually, in this instance, as much in the way of change in the upper midbrain as you saw there? No, it <coughs> looks more like the normal, doesn't it? Uh, and, but yet, up here, it looks very similar in terms of the corpus callosum. And you see a little bit, you see some loss of the, the cells in the upper cerebellum. So you can understand from this, this is that the, the presentation here is different um, than, uh, and it accounts for the variability in the disease. This is the young lady. This is the young lady, and I took these pictures of her two years ago, uh, who you just saw her brain. This is an absolutely wonderful individual, and you will see she has some, she has some armament in terms of her of her PSP. She is wearing a hat, you know, with the sun's bright in North Carolina, so a lot of people wear hats. But she indeed has her hat, and she has her sunglasses because of the, fo of the squinting and the light intolerance. You can see that she has no difficulty looking to the sides, but you can also see that when she attempts to look up and down, she is not able to do so. So it's one of the, one of the characteristics of the, of the disease. This is an uh, individual with CBGD in whom, again, you see the brain stem looking normal. Now, rem and remember, CBGD, PSP, similar mechanism, tau protein, but look at the way the brain is affected. Here you see this is much more, is somewhat more preserved in terms of the corpus callosum. But in the front portions of the brain, you have, you have uh, shrinkage. And up here, in terms of you have the hemisphere, and this is actually off to the, off to the um, left side, you have shrinkage of brain matter uh, over the cortex. But the brain stem and everything looks remarkably good. So, and here is an, uh, is an example of somebody with MSA. And remember, we said with MSA that you have the problem with uh, blood pressure regulation and so on. And here you can see that the brain stem, it's not just this upper portion is a little, but the whole thing is now lost volume. And your upper portion of the spinal cord has become thinner. And you have involvement here where this bat wing, which is where the, the spinal fluid is made, becomes much larger uh, because it is compensating for a loss of brain volume. So this individual, um, I looked after him for many years, and he died about three months ago. Uh, now, to contrast this, this is one of our inflammatory neurological disorders. This is multiple sclerosis. And this is an individual who's had the disease for 16 years. She continues to run a government department with 41 
people in it. And she is a darn good government administrator. We have had some fun in, in, uh, in the US with the, with the Toronto mayor's uh, <laughs> issues, um, because we always, we always thought that l l laughing at politicians was a, was a Canadian uh, aimed at Washington enterprise. So it's been somewhat fun to do it the other way around. <laughs> Uh, but this is an extremely bright lady. But you look here and you can see this is an immunologic neurologic disease. And you can see that the brain has been, the white matter has been attacked in these various places. So the interesting thing about this individual, 16 years into the diagnosis, still working, still r running a government department. How many, how many treatments did we have for multiple sclerosis in 1990? We had none. How many do we have now? 11. Okay? So that is, and I mentioned that. This is a PSP talk, but I think we can learn from other diseases in terms of where we have gone. And sort of, you know, in the late 70s, Houston Merritt, who I, uh, who I quoted earlier in terms of, PSP, that he didn't, didn't, seem, didn't seem to quite get it in terms of that. Uh, you can also say that Dr. Merritt didn't quite get it in terms of MS, because in the late 70s, he said, the way to, uh, the way to totally torpedo a promising academic career for a young neurologist was to specialize in multiple sclerosis. So um, even the best of us don't do well in terms of prediction. So what are we looking for as a cause? A tauopathy. So what on earth does that mean? Uh, so tau is this protein which, stabili which stabilizes microtubules which exist in the axon of a neuron but not in the dendrite. So the axon and the dendrite, the dendrite are the, are the um, um, if you, if you uh, liken an, an axon and its dendrites to a spider, um, then the spider legs is the dendrite, and the axon is the body. Um, and so they are derived, tau is derived from alternative splicing single gene MATP microtubule associated, and it stabilizes microtubules. This all gets very complicated. And there are multiple forms of tau in the human brain. And we are beginning to understand that a lot of the disorders are linked in terms of difficulties with uh, tau. And there are three or four binding domains which stabilize this network uh, by binding a positive charge to a negative microtubule. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about that in a minute because I, there's an interesting analogy that may be correct. So that's, a, that's just a picture downloaded off the uh, internet of a microtubule uh, network uh, adjacent to the nucleus of a cell. And that then you have, so that's a primary degenerative condition. And then you have, uh, on the other hand, multiple sclerosis, as I said, a, a inflammatory disorder where you have this complex interaction between T cells, which are white blood cells in, uh, which are in the circulation, attacking the central nervous system uh, and creating this cascade of biochemical change. So um, I'm going, let's go back and talk about what my comment in terms of, so you see the eye doctor. And the eye doctor says the eyes work normally. So um, what's, the what's the significance of that loss of eye movement in PSP? Without the stabilizing effect of the vestibulo-ocular reflex. Now, vestibulo, that's the inner ear connecting the eyes, OK? You know, you go, you go around on a merry-go-round, and you're stimulating your inner ear, and you have the visual. Issue. Okay, so without um, that reflex, head tilt or head shift of as much as, as little as two hertz or eight, 80 degrees can result in retinal slip, which alters visual acuity. And visual acuity declines at a point two degrees from the center of the fovea. 
So the fovea is in the retina. That's where, if you remember when, we, when you did optics in high school, that's where the light beam goes. It goes to that place. Well, if it's two degrees off, then you are going to lose 50% of your vision. So when the eye doctor's got you and he's got you in that contraption, well, your eyes aren't moving, right? So it's every, everything's focused in the middle. So of course it works okay. But when it's moving, then it doesn't, okay? And that's why people complain about that there is uh, uh, this loss of vision. So the fovea is the part of the retina where photoreceptor -dense density is greatest and uh, this reflex is impaired in PSP. So when you look at the whole system, so how do, is all of this balanced, is you get diagrams like this. So you have the cortex, brain cortex, and then you have the, these various nuclei in the brain, in the basal ganglia, which are the movement centers, and the brain stem, and you have a feedback loop. And so in the cortex, you have places, uh, uh, in Parkinson's disease, you have places where there is a block, and you have in MSA and in PSP, you have these places that are not working. So what is that? It's a defective feedback loop. Okay? It's not feeding back properly. So you think, ab you think about cruise control in the car. Okay? So what does it do? It, it applies more g as, you are, um, as you start on a hill in order to keep speed constant. It increases the gas. As you go downhill, it decreases. That's because there's a, there's a speed sensor and it's feeding back. So the whole key to this is the most exquisite servo mechanism, exquisite control system in the world. And you think about this in terms of like um, uh, in the animal world, and you think about the monkey jumping from tree to tree, and, it, and you, can, you can see how this works. And so feedback in the central nervous system is behind eye movement, cerebellar control of, of movement. Think about musicians, and you think about the, about the feedback that is occurring in terms of a musician, is when they are playing, is that they are using the ear. It is going through, it is feeding back in terms of, and it ends up out in the hand. It's it is absolutely remarkable. Balance in terms of, as we go off, uh, balance the correcting reflex. Think about when we were uh, kids and we walked on stilts. Why were you, did you have difficulty with that? Because the feedback loop is being interrupted. Okay. Now, um, so does anybody uh, anybody know who this man is? Are there any scientists in the room that know who this man is? This is John Clerk Maxwell, and it and it's an interesting photograph because uh, he and his wife Catherine he had had uh, very good taste. He married a Catherine too. Um, but he, and you will notice the uh, cross on his uh, um, that his wife is wearing. This is taken about 1860, and Maxwell is the link between Newton and Einstein. Maxwell is the man who figured out electromagnetic velocity in terms of uh, that light light waves and electromagnetic radiation was the same thing. He figured out that uh, Saturn, um, uh, what Saturn's rings were made of, uh, and Voyager in 1980 proved him right. Uh, he published the first article on color vision and an analysis of how humans did color vision in 1862. He finished his degree at Cambridge at, uh, at the age of 21 when, and was appointed a full professor. At, at 22, and that wasn't a, a PhD, that was a bachelor's degree. Uh, and he uh, wrote a paper. He wrote a paper which was entitled On Governors. And you think about governors. 
Governors were things for steam engines, but it basically it was something to keep speed constant, to modulate movement. And, and uh, so the key idea that Maxwell came up with for the first time was negative feedback. You control a uh, output to a desired value, compare the actual output against what's required, feed the difference back into the system to make the output converge on the wanted value. So you, when you're trying to inhibit a tremor, you are, you're, you're blocking it down to uh, where you want it. The same with walking. If you can't do it, then you have a disturbed servo. So uh, in uh, Maxwell um, uh, and Wiener subsequently used the term cybernetics, and it's a, it's a uh, derivative of the old, old Greek term, um, Kubernetes, which means steersman. At any rate, here's the here's the interesting it's the interesting thing. Uh, a disturbance in um, in movement is it can constantly diminish. It's an oscillation of continuously increasing amplitude or decreasing amplitude. And the first and third cases are inconsistent with stability of motion. Second and fourth are admissible in a good gov. This condition is mathematically equivalent to the condition to, and then he goes on in terms of calculus. I've not been able to figure out it out beyond the third degree. And that is Maxwell's equation of motion. Okay. So he figured that out. So you start thinking. Remember I thought it's talking about positivity and negativity. And so Maxwell indicated um, the actual motions corresponding to the are not generally taken notice of um, in altering. There is a limit at which the disturbance, instead of subsiding more rapidly, becomes an oscillating and jerking motion, increasing in violence until it reaches the limit. This takes place when the possible part of one of the impossible routes becomes positive. So in other words, it is a chemical change in terms of negativity and positivity. And Max, Maxwell was talking about this 150 years ago. So in, in terms of just, uh, it's kind of um, uh, in terms of the brilliance of that man uh, and that he was a Scot, he, he was also a poet. And he, he did have this um, poem, uh, which is his best known, entitled Rigid Body Sings. And, and whether he's talking about the atom or whether he's talking about um, uh, movement disorders or whether he's talking about um, at something else, I'm not sure. But, so, but when you think about that, can replacement by a single chemical, like we do with insulin and, and levodopa, clearly those don't cure a disease. And so if we are seeking a chemical to restore this multiple servo that we have lost in, these in this type of neurological condition, which think back to the pictures of the brainstem and that all of those feedback, the circuits that do those feedback loops have been uh, destroyed, that probably isn't going to work. So if we're thinking about Maxwell's equation, and Maxwell's equation, it's like the Euclidean laws of, of geometry. It applies to, it applies to everything in the u universe, likely. So, but to stop the generative, degenerative process or its trigger, we've got to do something else. So in the meantime, I thought this was a wonderful quote the, uh, that Deborah Young Bradshaw, this was just written in neurology um, uh, in May of this year. The physician's duty is to give credence to the family's concern without judgment, with a kind of innocence and trust, and to understand that a patient and his or her family, already devastated by the illness, need more help than most, not less. And that's what we have to do until we find that cure. Finding that cure and looking after the patients, that's the challenge. <laughs>